Start recording. Welcome, everybody. We just played Left Behind by Forgotten Faces. Uh, Nate, are you in Forgotten Faces now? Is that uh, an accurate statement? You guys hear me? Streaming? Testing. Testing. Hello? Hello? Okay. So, Nate... Uh, I don't... Maybe you can't see the Seaside see One channel. Let me tag him real fast. Uh, let's see here. Nope. Oh, yep. Yeah, I can hear something. Something coming through. Nate, you here? Yeah. Cool. Uh, you wanna you wanna say anything about your band? Um, before we I just I'm I'm officially part of them. I'm starting to practice with them. Or is it official or unofficial? It's unofficial right now. Unofficial. I'll, it'll be official when I jump on the first the the um, probably December show. Cool. 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 Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I've uh, I think it's some pretty damn good music. So. Yeah, they're way better than that bullshit band. <laughs> <laughs> so everyone, uh, Nate here uh, is a computer science major, right? Yeah, I, at least I think that's what I'm going for. <laughs> <laughs> I have a minor. In, I'm getting a minor in software engineering too. Dang. Okay. So you're at CSU, yeah. CSUMB right now, technically. Yeah, I'm in the final semester. Oh, God. Cool. Do you have any advice to the uh, CSI 1 students here that are that are in their first semester? CSI 1? That's your, like, logic. Logic and stuff, yeah. I, I got a delivery coming in, so enter, entertain the class. Do you guys go over, like, P and Q premise? So, uh, everybody, please give a uh, big applaud for uh, rock star Nate Beal uh, coming in and uh, talking to you guys. He's um, uh, one more semester to go at CSUMB, and then he'll be a he'll be a, a, this yeah. a real boy like Pinocchio. After that, I'm gonna be a real boy. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, meantime, right now, Curdy, we're going through this. Uh, we're doing microservices. Mm. Microservice architecture. That's how they call it now, huh? Yeah, it's just like different. It's like different unit level like Java programs inter interacting with each other, but they don't know anything about each other. It's kind of weird. It's also really annoying to code because you got to use like REST APIs and stuff. Mm -hmm. It's uh, everybody always talks about how their APIs are RESTful. Yeah. Yeah. It's a thing. All right. Well, well not, we just we implemented Rabbit ones too, and I'm like, I have no idea what these are. <laughs> Well, cool. Thanks like, for like, thanks, like, We we yeah, we have like a lecture, but our teacher doesn't really <laughs> explain very well. Yeah, whereas uh, whereas uh, this lecture, you know, I'm just having a, a rock star come and talk to my students. So. <laughs> I was I was talking to uh, Steph this morning, and I was like, look, I would probably be like ten times more knowledgeable if Kearney just taught all my upper division courses. <laughs> well, thank you, but uh, there's a. Uh, there's a lot of stuff I don't know. Like computer science is a is a really big yeah, no, it is. really big it field. Is. So yeah. still you probably could like learn it for like a day and then explain it better than this <laughs> old fart does. Well thank you. I, I appreciate that. Uh, yeah. maybe uh, um, yeah, maybe someday you can teach me to play play the guitar. I don't know. <laughs> this yeah, this is right now this is just a game controller, so you know. <laughs> yeah. All right, cool. Thanks a lot, Nate. Just learn everything that he teaches you because it's very useful in upper division shit. <laughs> cool. All right, I'm I appreciate it, man. Thanks a lot. Yeah, and I'll uh, I, I posted the link to your uh, uh, playlist uh, to the to the channel. To their to their playlist. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right. All right. Thanks a lot. Man. Good to see you. See ya. All right. So we got a midterm on Friday. I'm sure you're all interested in hearing about it. Uh, not the rock star programming language, which is pretty cool. I'm going to bookmark that. Um, and uh, yeah, so here is uh, one more time. I'll post his unofficial uh, band he's apparently practicing with now. Um, sounds pretty pretty darn good, though. Like, I, I got to say, like, I, I was pretty impressed by that. Um, okay, so let's talk about midterms, 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 midterms. There's going to be one on Friday, 
And let me let me just go over this. Let me do this midterm review. We'll just talk about all the all the stuff you need to know for this. Okay, so because I know this question will get asked because every time I do an online midterm, everybody asks me this question: How do I take the midterm? Okay, step one: Go to Canvas. <laughs> Go to the modules section or the quizzes section. It is just a quiz like your like your daily quizzes. Okay. So if you've been able to take the daily quizzes, you should be able to take the midterm. If you haven't figured out how to log on to Canvas yet, Lord have mercy on your soul. <laughs> it's, it's week six. So uh yeah, it'll just be like, it's going to be like, just like one of the daily quizzes, just more questions. Okay. Uh, the midterm opens at 11 a.m. on Friday. The, what is that? Uh, first, first, yeah. Uh, 10, 1, 21. And closes, hard close at 10 a.m. on Monday. Once you start it, you will have two hours. Okay. Shouldn't take two hours, but I don't like rushing students. But at the same time, I don't like it to be too long because then you can just sit there and Google things infinitely. So how many questions? Uh, 20 to 30 questions, something like that. Uh, maybe less. I don't know. It depends how generous I'm feeling. Um, uh, multiple choice, mostly. Uh, maybe some matching or something. Maybe true false. Depends how generous I'm feeling. Uh, all right, so um, yeah, it'll just be like the quizzes, but bigger. Topics. When is this again? Sorry. <laughs> there. Am I streaming? I'm streaming, right? Stream, stream two. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, no, it's just funny because I, I get I will get asked this question. It, it, it's it, yeah, it, it's fine. It's fine. I get asked this question all the time. Uh, don't forget to take the midterm. Um, last year, a student forgot to take it, and then afterwards asked me to write him a letter of recommendation, and I was like. Don't think I can do that. Sorry. <laughs> uh, do we have class on Friday? Yeah, yeah, we'll have a normal class on Friday. Um, uh, we'll we'll be going over some new stuff. Today we're just going to be doing a midterm review. Okay, we're gonna today just go over the the stuff. So if you know all the stuff already, I guess you can you can leave. But probably this this might be useful to you. Okay, so. Um, Yeah, I forgot to take the midterm, but can you write me a letter of rec? <sighs> yeah. Yeah, like, I, I mean, I could have. <laughs> I could have, but you probably, it was probably better for me not to. Um, okay, so. Uh, yeah, so the topics. Topics are going to be theories of truth. Logic, um, truth tables, implications, modus ponens, modus ponens, firming the consequent fallacy, denying the antecedent fallacy. Invalid, valid, sound arguments, which will be probably m more of this than anything else, probably. Because you guys, we've, we've done so many quizzes on them, I feel like there will be more midterm questions on them. So, um, let's see, cooking and butterflies, yeah. <laughs> 
Uh, yeah, probably something on Scratch. Um, uh, maybe a couple easy questions on Scratch. Um, uh, ethical theories. So theories of truth that you have to know are uh, correspondence, coherence, consensus, consensus, uh, all starting with CO, which is super tough, I know. Pragmatic, um, Marxist, uh, what was the other one? Uh, deflationary. So you have to know the, uh, the five theories of truth. And uh, watch the easy questions on Scratch be the hardest questions. Yeah, implement a ray tracer in Scratch. You have two hours to begin. <laughs> it's the entire midterm. <laughs> Make World of Warcraft in Scratch. You have 120 minutes. <laughs> Call of Duty Warzone. Okay, um, we'll we'll go over all this stuff today. I'm just kind of like hashing out the big big topics. Uh, social issues in computer science. Also, we've talked about two so far. Those are piracy and autonomous vehicles. A little bit about autonomous vehicles, and then the ethical theories you have to know are. Uh, divine command theory, utilitarianism, specifically moral hedonism. There's a, like I've said before, I'm, I, I try to be very precise with my language. Um, the type of utilitarianism I presented is something called moral hedonism or ethical hedonism is probably more common name for it than moral hedonism. Ethical hedonism. Um, but there's other kinds of utilitarianism as well. There's like rule utilitarianism, which we haven't gone over. It's very popular though. So. Um, Consequent. Uh, that sorry, it's, yeah, it's just a, it's one, uh, yeah, maybe we'll do it this one. Ethical hedonism is a form of utilitarianism. Utilitarianism is a form of consequentialism. So, uh, consequentialism. Yeah, so consequential, con consequentialist ethical, ethical theories mostly concern the outcomes of your actions. So you're cleaning the, um, uh, the State Department, you know, in some room, you're a janitor, and you accidentally hit a a red button and you nuke the whole world, you know, you know, a consequentialist might say, well, what you did was a bad, a bad thing. You brought about the end of the world. Whereas a um, deontologist would say, well, he didn't know people make, you know, like he didn't intend to destroy the world. Right. You know, and maybe, yeah, my bad. That's all you have to say. You just have to say my bad and then it's all good. Right. That's, that's just how my bad works. <laughs> Um, <laughs> kill, Kilimanjaro. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, one of my uh, friend's sons, when he was about eight or nine, discovered the power of my bad. And so he realized that he could just kind of do anything and then just say, oh, my bad, afterwards. And so he walked up to his brother with like a Nerf bat and just like cracked his brother over the head with the Nerf bat. And then his parents are like, what the hell did you just do? And he looks at him and goes, oh, my bad. <laughs> <laughs> so a deontologist would say like his intention was bad. And the consequentialist would say him cracking his brother over the head was bad, you know. So uh, he, he just had learned, like, it just it's a get-out-of-jail-free card. You know, you do something bad, you apologize for it, everything's fine, you know? So he just very deliberately just cracked his brother in. 
Oh, my bad. <laughs> Brilliant. That's like, it's, you know, <laughs> murder somebody. Oh, my bad. <laughs> All right. So then we talked about uh, Conti and ethics, uh, uh, which includes like the uh, categorical imperative, which is. Uh, uh, Conti and ethics are a form of deontology. Okay. Um, deontological ethics care about duty and intention. Okay. Deontological ethics care about duty and intention of your action. Um, consequentialistic ethics care about the outcome of your actions. Mostly. Like all of them, all of them like kind of like, you know, a, a consequentialist would still probably look askance at the person intending to harm somebody, right? Like it's not like purely the outcomes. Like if he missed, like, you know, like... You know, it's it's not like these things are just like a, you know, just a straight cut and dry, like deontological people don't care about the outcomes because clearly, you know, they do, right? They want the world to be a good place, you know, and uh, consequentialists, you know, presumably want people to behave in such a way that there is good outcomes, right? So it's, it's not like there's this like hard line between the two of them, but it, it's kind of a general notion. Okay. Uh... Yeah, Mendez, you missed a, a, a rock star coming in here. Uh, former student of mine, a friend now, who's a member of a, a, a unofficial member joining a, a band or something. I don't know. We'll see. So, uh, you're not docked points for live attendance. Also true. Also true. Um, and, and, it, and remember, attendance isn't exactly what I, I care about in this class. Uh, what I care about is participation. Right, and so like uh, I was uh, uh, reading uh, uh, rate my professor for myself at Fresno State, which only has like two reviews on it, and one of them's positive, and the other one's like, I don't understand why we have to have attendance for an asynchronous class. It's like, okay, that's on me. Like the reason why I require attendance is because participation is very very important in a critical thinking class. Right, you can't just be like sit back and I'm like I'm gonna learn by just listening to YouTube videos to become a critical thinker, right? You have to engage in it, you know, like you have to participate in it and, and say things and like debate and like discuss. And that's, it's all part of the development process of a critical thinker. And, uh, you, you know, you know, maybe I didn't make that clear last semester. I don't know. But, um, so, uh, you were docked points on Monday. I was actively talking while not talking about texting. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if, if you think that you didn't get credit when you should have just, just message me. Like I said, I'm not, I'm not super like, I, like, I'm not like super punitive in this class. Like I just want you to participate. And if like you didn't quite talk enough one of the days, um, then just message me and I'll go through the chat logs. And, like I, I'm, I'm honestly not here to beat you guys up, even though it might seem that way with the topics we talk about. Um, I, I really actually just want you to become critical thinkers because it's good for our society. It's good for you. It's good for me. You know, when I go into my old age and retire, I want to have a bunch of critical thinkers running America and not like a bunch of people that just like believe whatever they, you know, read on the internet or whatever. You know what I mean? So, uh, people be putting participation in their messages. Yeah. Uh, rate my professor's wild. Yeah. I don't know. Like it was just like, you know, and the person reported they got a D, so I was like, well, I don't know. Maybe that, you know, maybe you didn't attend the first, I don't know. Who knows? Okay. Um, so, uh, deontological ethics, Kantian ethics, yeah. And we'll, we'll go over all these things. Uh, I'm just kind of getting them down. Um, I can't theory, ethical hedonism. Let's see. Uh, virtue ethics. It's another big one. Um, uh, what was the other big one I'm missing? Oh, uh, natural rights theory. Right. Right, 
So there's uh, five ethical theories you have to know. And there are five theories of truth you have to know. And then as far as socialist issues in computer science, uh, understand the issues with piracy and autonomous vehicles a little bit. A little bit. I'll probably have one question of each on these. Okay. So uh, let's, let's run through the entire semester to date, if that works for you guys. I might go a little bit over because I had a, a forklift in my driveway that I had to I had to take care of real fast. So um, if you if you have to leave at ten fifty, that that's fine. Like um, I, I just want to make sure that you're all sufficiently prepared for the midterm. Um, uh, why it is actually a nice day today? It was actually was yeah. So um, okay, so let's do this. So correspondence theory. Uh, I'm going to give a definition and an example of both of them. And you should be able to identify when people are using these theories of truth. So um, be able to identify when a person is using one theory of truth or another on the midterm. Right? Okay, so correspondence theory. That which is true is that which corresponds to your reality. Uh, for example, um, the statement Joe Biden is president is true because in reality Joe Biden is president. Yep. So, um, Phantasmophobia. Yeah, you're braver than I am. I, I watched my friends streaming that game. No desire to play it. Uh, we could I don't know, do Jackbox or something. I don't know. Okay, so uh, midterm, midterm, midterm. How about that? Okay. Um, yeah, that's. I don't know. It's pretty straightforward. Like the statement "Snow is white" is true because. Snow is white, I guess, in mass. Um, this lecture will be posted. Yeah, I, I post all my lectures. And uh, I'm going to update the PowerPoint presentations on Canvas as well. Uh, I've tweaked them a little bit and kind of moved some slides around. So um, I'll have a full set of slides for you guys. Uh, the, um, if you go onto Canvas and you check the files section, you can see that there are... All of the PowerPoints on here, so um, I will update those during the the break. Okay. Um, what the hell? With what? Huh? Okay. Okay. Coherence theory. That which is true is that which matches things I know to be true. Okay. Um, Example, the statement, George Washington never told a lie is true because it matches other things I know to be true about George Washington. Okay. Well, they're not, I don't know, but you're right, but it's not actually true. Well, somebody who's a coherence person would say, no, it is true, right? That That's, you know, a real big difference between correspondence and coherence, right? Like, a correspondence person would be like, all right, let's go through the historical record and, like, see the statements he made and see if he made any lies. And a coherence person says, no, it's true because it, it matches things I know to be true about George Washington. Uh, we typically use this more in math, right, where you start with axioms that aren't very controversial. And... Uh, so, commonly used in math, uh, correspondence is commonly used in science. All right. So, consensus theory. Um, when is the midterm? It opens at 11 a.m. on Friday, closes at 10 a.m. on Monday. 
It's a hard close. Do not start the midterm at 9 a.m. and expect to get till 11. One of my friends did this. Did not work well for him because the door slams shut on you. You will not have a good time, trust me. Okay, so uh, consensus theory. Uh, that which is true is that which uh, most people agree is true. Example. The statement, Bob is a liar and a thief, is true because everyone knows it's true. Okay. And again, somebody might be like, wait, that's just the ad populum fallacy. And we're going to be talking more about fallacies, probably on, probably on Friday, actually. We'll, we'll start getting into that. Um... um but if you believe in consensus theory, um, no, it's true. Everybody agrees that he's a liar and a thief. Can't trust him. So it's true. Um, this is commonly used with definitions, right? What makes a word have a certain definition? It's generally, there's a consensus on it, right? Uh, and it's, it's consensus is also used in uh, science to a certain extent. Like there's a scientific consensus and uh, with uh, scientific consensus, also, it's like uh, there is a scientific consensus: global warming is true, so therefore it's true. Uh, but definitions are pretty much established by consensus. Either a large group of people all use um, a word in a certain way. Uh, for example, what does the word "dab" mean? There's a word you might not have heard in a couple of years. What does it mean to, what is, what is DAB? D-A-B. Database administrator? No. What, what does DAB mean? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, um, until about two years ago, DAB means like you get a Q-tip, you like dab it in water or whatever. And then all of a sudden, like a couple years ago, people were doing this thing, and like I don't know why that was the thing, but it became a thing, and it was called dabbing, and it's just like okay, now people know that the word dab either means to touch something lightly or to do this thing with your arms, which that and and why does it mean that? Well, because everybody knows that's what it means. You know, it's consensus theory. Um, yeah, I don't. I does anybody know where that came from? Because I I certainly don't. I was just sort of puzzled and mystified and I'm going to chuck myself into an old person's home now. I don't know. Yeah. That and the, I mean, the fidget spinners, I get a little bit, you know, that was like 2017, I think about four years ago. They're like fidget spinners everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so pragmatic theory, um, that which is true is that which is beneficial. Example statement gravity is true, uh, gravity is real, whatever is true because it doesn't matter if it's actually curvature of space time or gravitons interacting or whatever if you jump off a cliff, you dead. Okay. So, um, commonly used with imperfect information. Right. So like a lot of times you don't know, like pragmatic theories used a lot of times when you just don't know enough. Right. All right. We, we know this and this, we know that uh, the Russians have established um, nuclear bombs in Cuba. We don't know what their intentions are. You know, do you want to wait to find out? You know, or do you want to do a uh, blockade of, of Cuba? Like, you know, um, pragmatic theory is not used very often when we have actual full knowledge of something, right? It's, it's more of a shorthand for like, you know, what, you know, if you don't have enough information, what should we do? So, uh, it's from a song by the Migos. Okay, all right, cool. It's good to know. All right. 
All right, so uh, Marxist theory. Um, that which uh, do that which is true is that which benefits us politically. Technically, uh, that which is true is that which benefits the revolution. But in reality, um, in like modern politics, it's mostly just like what benefits our party. Right. Um, and you will see this theory of truth used, commonly used in politics. Right. So everything our side says is true. Everything the other side says is a lie. They're morons. We're geniuses. Sometimes very stable geniuses, in fact. And uh, so um, one of the reasons why there's this ongoing uh, polarization of America politically is because both parties have sort of leaned into this. Like, you know, everything uh, Trump does is horrible and awful. You know, it's the Democrat view, obviously. And, um, the Republican view, and again, generalizing very broadly, crudely even. Uh, but, you know, the Republican view, you know, Trump's the God Emperor and, and all this kind of stuff, right? It can do no wrong, you know. Uh, 5D chess and all this kind of stuff, right? So, uh, Marxist theory, um, yeah. And so the, uh, um, this, you, you won't find this, by the way, in most, like, um, textbooks and things like that. Uh, this theory of truth, though, comes from a, um, an article I read called Pravda Means Truth. And I found it very interesting because it's like, you know, I study theories of truth and stuff like that. And there was this article called Pravda Means Truth, which uh, uh, in the Soviet Union, they had a newspaper called Pravda. That was their, uh, the Communist Party's official publication, right? And they would publish the truth. Pravda Means Truth. And so it, it went into like this explanation of like what true means isn't like small truth which is what they call it like you know chernobyl's melting down or whatever right the big truth is that um you know what benefits us politically right that the revolution is spreading that uh, the marxist revolution is inevitable there's these big truths that must be true and small trivial details like you know people are starving to death are sort of you know swept under the rug right so I found that interesting. You're not going to find that in uh, probably any textbooks and things like that. It's just uh, something that I found, and, and it works really well to explain politics, too. Okay, then deflationary theory of truth is um, when, when you say that's true, you're just agreeing with someone. Nothing more. So... Um, So basically with deflationary theory, there's actually no such thing as truth, right? So uh, not not in the normal sense we think of it. Like a statement is true, a statement's false. Um, dogs bark, you know, that there's no such thing of, of like that being a true thing, that dogs bark. Like there's no such thing as that. It's just like when somebody said dogs bark, you know, like that's true. You're just saying, I agree with you. I have this emotion. I have a psychological state that... It's just saying, yeah, I've seen dogs bark. It's, you know, I'm agreeing with you when I say that's true. And so deflationary theory is like, kind of like there's really no objective truth. There's only subjective truth. Maybe that's better with me. Uh, for example, um, you might've heard this before. Um, well, that might be true for you but it's not true for me. That would be sort of an expression of that, right? So when you're saying that, you're oftentimes invoking deflationary theory or other kinds of what are called emotive theories of truth, non-cognitive um, theories of truth, um, which uh, basically mean that um, truth is an opinion, right? Like a lot of times you try to s separate out facts and opinions and for uh, these emotive, non-cognitive people, um, it's all opinion, right? So, no division between 
facts and opinions. 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 Okay. So that's uh, deflationary theory. And, and deflationary theory is, I'm really giving it a little bit too much credit. There's many different um, emotivism school of thought things on truth, but I'm just sort of lumping them all together. Probably, <clears throat> probably a little bit inaccurately here, but you know, I, I, for this class, it's not a philosophy class. I really don't want to get into the tree of all the different possibilities that people have in, in philosophy. I'm just kind of doing the big picture stuff. Okay. My motivation for making crystal meth is subjective. <laughs> That's funny. Okay. Uh, all right. So truth tables, um, right. Uh, the way you, you do a truth table is, uh, you start with the left columns having all of your variables and you write down all the combinations of true and false for them. And then you work to the right one column at a time doing an and, an or, or a not between the two columns corresponding to its arguments. Yep. Um, it's like I want to do a truth table with just two variables in it, x, y, and I'm trying to figure out the truth of like not x and y, let's say. Um, you start off by doing true, 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 false, false, true, false, false. And so you work, um, like the first thing I have to do is this one, right? You have to do the inner part first. I, can't, I obviously can't do the not first because the not takes this as the parameter. So I'm going to figure out X and Y. And so what I do is every and and or takes two parameters, every not takes one. And so the two parameters to this one are this column and this column. And the rule for and is it's true if both of them are true and it's false otherwise. So this would be true, false, false, false. And then I do the next column, which is the not of X and it with Y. That takes this column as a parameter and it flips the values. And that's how you do a truth table. And so for the uh, midterm, you will need to fill out a truth table like this. And it'll be fill in multiple blanks. And so basically you're gonna type a bunch of T's and a bunch of F's and you'll have to fill out something maybe not too much more complicated than this. Okay. Um, review the Zybooks. The Zybooks has a lot of stuff on truth tables, so review that if you sort of click through it. Uh, implications, um, X implies Y is true in all cases, except when X is true and Y is false. So the only time I can lie when I say I will take you to Disneyland if you clean your room. The only time I can lie is if I if you clean your room and I don't take you to Disneyland, right? I didn't say anything about what would happen if you don't clean your room, right? So I could take you to Disneyland anyway. I wouldn't be lying. The only time I would lie is when you clean your room and I break my promise to take you to Disneyland. And this key thing here is feeds into modus ponens, modus tollens, affirming the consequent and denying the antecedent, and a lot of the invalid, valid, and sound things. This little thing here, that one highlighted thing that is blocked by the stupid ribbon. Thank you. Um, that is crucial to programming, uh, cause that's how if and then statements work in programming and scratch when you have the conditional that you put the little diamond in and stuff like that, or the hexagon thing. Um, X implies Y if X, then Y is what that means. Okay. In English, if X, then Y. That's what that means. 
the only time that that uh, statement is a lie is if X does happen and then Y doesn't happen. Okay, you have to go. Well, this be on YouTube. Yeah, I, I like I said, I'm gonna I'm gonna run long today, just because I want to make sure I've gone over everything, and you can you can pick up the rest of this on YouTube. Again, I had a I had a forklift in my driveway, right? Like a couple minutes into class, and I had to jet out there and handle that. Uh, so I'm gonna go a little bit over. Uh, okay, modus ponens um, is a valid form of our argumentation. Valid form of argument, and it is of this form. Um, if x then y. X is true, Y is true. Modus tollens, also valid. If X, then Y. Y is false, X is false. That's also legal. Because if we know that Y is false, X cannot be true. Because if X was true, then Y must be true. Now, the thing that gets everybody is that, like, what if X is false? We don't know anything, right? If I say, if X is true, then Y, I haven't said anything. I haven't said a damn thing about what happens if, uh, I, this, I, I will, I'll post this notebook also, uh, uh, quitter. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll share this with y'all. So you, you don't need to screenshot it. Um, send a copy of the page, copy link, uh, Anyone with the link? Copy. Copy. And there, there's the notes. See, actually. Um, so there's there's a thing, and I'll 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 pin that as well. Uh, there. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah. So the the key thing that people don't get is that if I say if x then y. If X is false, I don't know anything. All I've, I, I don't know anything. Like, if I say, if you hand me $5, I'll, I'll give you a, a cell phone. I haven't said anything about what happens if you don't give me $5, right? That's the key thing that people don't get. Because in English, um, if I say, if you give me five bucks, I'll give you a cell phone, there's an implication that it works the other way as well. That if you don't give me five bucks, I won't give you the cell phone. You know what I mean? But I, I haven't said anything. Like it, this is this is the key thing. This this line right here, that's the key thing, for like a lot of this class so far, is that if I say if you give me five bucks, I'll give you a cell phone, and you don't give me any money, I could still give you the cell phone, right? If I bring a, an umbrella every time it rains, I didn't say anything about what happens when it's sunny. I might bring an umbrella anyway because it's going to keep the sun off my face, and I need to keep my baby perfect complex complexion. <laughs> okay. So, uh, yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, this is valid and this is valid. Okay. Affirming the consequent is a fallacy. And so it is of the form if X, then Y, Y is true, X is true. Okay. This is a fallacy. Is not valid. Okay. <laughs> it indented that. That's funny. And then denying the antecedent is of this form: if x, then y. X is false, therefore y is false. Okay. Ew. Just uh, yeah, there we go. <laughs> Move this out of the way. There we go. Let's get that over there. Okay. Um, and so for invalid, valid, and sound, question one is the form valid? If not, it is invalid and stop. Question two is are the premises true? If not, it is valid but not sound. If yes, then it is valid and sound. Okay. 
a uh, couple things on Scratch. Uh, if you did Scratch, you should be able to do those. Um, affirming the fallacy and denying the antecedent in invalid forms. Yes, fallacy. Fallacy means um, means invalid form of argument. Yeah, good question. Literally, the word fallacy means uh, a formal fallacy. Formal fallacy means the argument is invalid. So any argument of this form or this form are automatically invalid. You do not have to look at the premises. You do not have to determine if they're true. Um, it is invalid if they are of either of these forms. Good question. All right, so finally, uh, we've got our ethical uh, theories. So divine command theory is, uh, so ethical theories concern what is right versus wrong or good versus evil or a duty to do something or a duty. Yeah, there's a lot of different ways of phrasing it. Uh, divine command theory is, um, God or Zeus or yeah, Buddha or uh, uh, religious scriptures. Your choice determines what is right and wrong. Example: um, coveting your neighbor's ass is wrong because it violates one of the Ten Commandments. Okay. So uh, ethical hedonism is uh, pleasure is equivalent to good, pain is equivalent to evil. Again, there's different ways of phrasing this. Um, we have an obligation or um, moral actions cause net pleasure. Immoral actions cause net pain. And uh, pleasure can mean things like bodily health Satisfaction, a job, well done, etc. Okay. So it's it's more than just like a, a lot of times people think pleasure and pain are like literally just like I don't know if you do heroin right like ah, you know clearly it's a good a good action right because you're feeling pleasure because you're shooting up heroin right but pleasure encompasses like uh, 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 you know, you know, you, you make a chair and you're like, oh, that's a damn good chair. You know, like that's a form of pleasure, right? Or you go to the opera and the op and you're just like, oh, it, 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 it made me cry. The opera was so beautiful. You know, uh, that would be a form of pleasure, even though it looks like the people are crying. You know what I mean? Like, um, the, the, the terms pleasure and pain can be a little bit deceptive, especially since we call it, you know, hedonism. Um, let's pull that in a little bit. Um, because we call it hedonism, and hedonism is like, oh, ho, ho. you know, hedonism bot. Yeah. Have seen Futurama before. There's literally a robot called hedonism bot. And uh, he is both the person on the couch and the couch, you know, at the same time. Uh, see so yeah. And, um, yep. So, so pleasure and pain are a little bit more broad. You know, get things like, um, you know, for pain, even if, uh, you're not experiencing pain, if you have like, um, uh, cancer or something, you're even, even if you're not in pain, you know, being sick would be a form of pain, right? So they're, they're kind of more broad than just the raw sensations of pleasure and pain. 
Okay, so Kantian ethics. Uh, okay. Yeah, so Kantian ethics uh, would be um, good actions are those that if everyone did them, the world would be a better place. Uh, evil actions are those that if everyone did them, the world would be terrible. Different ways of saying this. Another way is uh, act as if your actions are universals, which is another way of saying the same thing right there. Uh, or treat individuals as bins, not means. That's another way they put it. So don't objectify human beings, like see humans as, you know, your actions towards people should not be steps towards some other goal. But your actions towards other people should be the goal. You should always try to act well towards other people. Okay. If everyone gave you $20, this world would be a better place. That's a good... Yeah. Yeah, there, there, there's some interesting uh, uh, add-ons to this kind of stuff, right? Like, um, there's a philosopher by the name of uh, Peter Singer who says that... Um, uh, he takes this quite literally, like... Um, Peter Singer believes we should expand our circle of interest to encompass all people, not just our friends. You know, and that he's not, a, he's really kind of a utilitarian, I think. He's not, I don't think he's a Kantian. Uh, but it has like some um, echoes there. Is, yeah, he's a utilitarian. Yeah. Okay. Um, but like uh, Peter Singer believes that one of the big problems we have with modern society is that we act well towards our friends and our family. Uh, and then as sort of our moral intuitions grow, we start then encompassing care for people in our city. And like we'll do things like do litter pickups and things like that. And as we develop our moral sensibilities, we care about people in our country you know, and people will do things like serve in the military and die for people they've never met. And he thinks that as this, if you continue this, your circle of interest that you care about grows and grows and grows, and it should encompass, comp, encompass animals as well. So he's a big animal rights activist who sees animal rights as the next step in moral evolution beyond just caring about people. And uh, so I, I probably shouldn't file this under Kantian ethics, but... Um, you know, it, it does tie into the notion of acting as if your actions are universal, like, you know. And so I, I uh, asked him a question because he's like, you know, you shouldn't privilege your your friends over, you know, other, you know, people in Africa, right? Um, that the, one of the big things is about charity, right? He thinks that you should make enough money to live and get by, and donate the rest of your money to charity, and that you shouldn't privilege people near you more than like people that need it more like in Africa. And so there's probably a Kantian ethic thing that could be made there. Like if everyone did this, the world would be a better place. Like rather than buying a PlayStation, you donate the money to build a well in, you know, Africa somewhere. Right. And, uh, so I asked him, I'm like, Hey, you know, presumably you buy your, your friend's birthday presents. My birthday is coming up. Uh, I sent him my address. I'm like, if, if you'd like to send me a birthday uh, present, here's here's my address, and he he, he didn't write back to me. So, um, <laughs> yeah, see you guys. So yeah, I, I I don't know I don't know how much he actually puts into practice. You know, you shouldn't privilege your friends and stuff like that. But um, it's it's not exactly the right category for this, but it's an interesting thing anyway. Uh, virtue ethics, <clears throat> um. Virtues, let's see here. Um, hmm. Yeah, see. Ya. Uh, virtues are, that's the best way of putting this, are good, are things that contribute to human flourishing. That's kind of an awkward way of putting it. Um, are things that help us be good at being human. Let's go this way. Um, so for example, being empathetic to others, um, <clears throat> being courageous, 
things like that. Uh, virtues, <coughs> Y in a golden mean, gold yin, <laughs> golden mean between uh, vices on either extreme. For example, um, gener generosity, generosity, generosity is a virtue, but if you uh, are too generous, that is a vice. People will take advantage of you and you'll lose your house and so forth. If you're too little generous, then you're kind of an asshole. Okay, so, you know, like there, there's sort of a uh, there's sort of this area in between the the extremes on other end, on, on either end, and both extremes are vices, and so virtues are actually in the middle, and so Aristotle believed in like finding the the middle way between danger on excess. Okay. Uh, and then uh, good actions uh, come from basically following and cultivating the virtues. Uh, evil actions come from long vices. That's, I guess, a reasonable enough way of putting it. Natural rights theory. Um, all humans have certain inalienable rights. Among them, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It's a declaration of independence. Uh, basis for, you know, America's rights system, basically. Um, good actions respect these rights. And other, other rights exist too, right? So other rights exist too, like the right to privacy. Good actions respect these rights. Evil actions violate these rights. But cannot remove them. And that's that's a key a key thing here. Um, social contract people think that rights come from the social contract slash government, and so can be revoked. In America, you can't revoke your right to free speech or whatever. Um, freedom of religion. In America, you can't revoke your right to freedom of religion. Uh, in a, a social contract person, like in France, they're like, yeah, if we're going to take away your freedom of religion, we can take it away. And uh, to a natural rights person, uh, you're violating my rights by doing that. Like, you can certainly hold a gun to my head and say you can't wear a crucifix at school. You can certainly do that but you violated my rights. You did not remove my rights because you can't remove my rights. You violated my rights. And there's a very, very significant difference between those two statements, right? The, the outcome's the same. Like, okay, fine, I'm not gonna wear my crucifix at school because, you know, that's the rule in France, right? You can't wear any ostentatious, like if you're Jewish, you can't wear a skull cap to school. Like it's against the law, you cannot do it. Um, if you're a Sikh, you can't wear the dagger. Uh, if you're a Christian, you can't, you can have like an unobtrusive crucifix, but if you're wearing something openly, that's against the law in France. And so in France, the, the notion is we can, we regulate, you know, how you can have freedom of religion. And, uh, in America, it's like, yeah, you can hold a gun to my head and say, like, you can't wear it. And I, I'm all, I'll be like, all right, fine. I won't wear it. But the crucial difference is I can say you did wrong. You violated my rights. That was an evil action. In France, you're just like, well, hey, uh, that's the social contract. If you want to live in France, you got to obey the the laicity law, the, the la siete uh, laws, right? That's a crucial, crucial difference between uh, natural rights and what's called social contract theory. So. Okay, um, yeah, and and so one, is, you know, in both cases, you're not wearing your crucifix, but in one case, you're like, you can be like you know, 
something evil happened and the other one was like that's just the price of living in society you know just, if you want to change it vote in different politicians you know okay and then finally we got piracy and autonomous vehicles um I, I can't imagine putting any too difficult questions on that um probably they're just going to be give me pickups um uh piracy um Um, yeah, what kind of question could I even ask on piracy? I don't know. Are there pros and cons to piracy that might give me trouble? I don't know. <laughs> Even though that was our, our assignment, right? Um, so yeah, I'll have to think of something. I, I can't imagine them being, being too difficult though. Okay. Nothing that makes you overthink. I know like that's, that's the trouble. Like I, I'm like, this is a clear, you know, like, this is really clear, right? Like, you know, Joe Biden is president. People are like Googling it. You know, <laughs> you know uh, like on one of the quizzes, I thought it was pretty obvious that no dog has ever served in the U.S. Senate or whatever. And I had <laughs> people like Google. I've been searching for an hour and I haven't been able to find any golden retrievers in Congress. And I was like, <laughs> it, was not, it was not supposed to be like a, a, a trick question. But yeah, yeah. It, to be fair, like, you know, after giving you, uh, the, the couple opening quizzes where, uh, you know, the, the snap judgment was wrong. Like, eh, it's fair enough. Fair enough. Only humans have served in Congress. Yeah. It's like, I don't know. I, I thought it was pretty straightforward. Like I, I literally don't try to do trick questions or anything like that. You know what I mean? Like, um, but yeah. So autonomous vehicles just, um, the big question with autonomous vehicles is, you know, the safety issue, right? The the big issue with autonomous vehicles is they are going to kill people at some point, right? So how do we handle that? You know, and, and you can have a whole thing on like insurance, like, because right now insurance is like you're, you, you insure the driver, but if you're not driving, does my insurance still cover the car? Or is it now product liability, right? There's a lot of like interesting questions when it comes to autonomous vehicles. Um, the only thing we really talked about is them running over people because that is kind of like the big issue, right? They are going to kill people. If they kill less people than human drivers, then, you know, that's probably okay. But that's still not going to be, that's going to be cold comfort to the people who get run over. You know what I mean? So, um, yeah. Um, I think that... Uh, yeah, that and, and the employment thing, like a uh, uh, bonus question about whether you spent $3,000 on here. <laughs> sure, yeah. <laughs> that actually might be the piracy question. How about that? Uh, <laughs> pirating MATLAB. I'll just, I'll, I'll put that up there. If people made it to the end of this talk, there you go. That'll be the, that'll be the question. Did Kearney pirate MATLAB after spending $3,000 on having them send him an empty box. Yeah, so. <laughs> I was like, I was just offended. It's like, you know, how do you charge that much money for a piece of software? You know, that's literally, all you have to do is just duplicate a CD or get a USB drive and just toss it in the FedEx box and you mailed me literally a manual for $3,000. You know what I mean? Like, it, it, at some point, like, when the price goes up high enough, like, at some, like, when you get a wedding cake, right? When you spend that much money on a wedding cake, what you're buying is the reliability. You are buying the fact that the, the person baking that cake will be there at your wedding on time with a cake that's made correctly and not collapsed. And that's why you pay $3,000 for a wedding cake. When you pay that much for software, they should have somebody who just makes sure that the thing goes in the box. Like I don't know. Anyway, anyway, rant over. So there you go. That that will be the that will be the piracy question. So thank you for making it. We've gone uh, significantly over, but um, I wanted to make sure I covered all the topics for the for the midterm. So if you're watching this at home, there you go. That's going to be a, that's going to be a, a free question for you. So see you guys on Friday. We will uh, start talking about more fallacies on Friday. And the midterm will open up after class. If you have any final questions about the midterm on Friday, you can always ask me in class then, and I will answer them. 
Okay. Thanks a lot, everyone.